hand direction. I appreciate that. Uh, and again, thank you all for coming today. It's an honor to talk to you. So let me outline my talk, first of all. I'm going to talk about what malaria is, why it's a big problem, and some interventions that can actually help mitigate or slightly solve the malaria problem. And I'm going to talk about our efforts to um, work on malaria. When I say our efforts, this is basically my group in computer science. There are people on this campus in entomology, biology, genomics, economics, who work on malaria too, and I'm not representing their wonderful work. This is just my work today, of course. So what is malaria? Malaria is a disease that presents itself like a bad flu. And in many cases, for many people, it simply is a bad flu. Some uh, shivers, some fevers, some aches and pains, and it's all over. But for some people, it's a death sentence. They will die at the end of this. And in particular, of the over 200 million people who get malaria each year, about a million of them will eventually die. So where does malaria come from? It's been around since the dawn of antiquity. We know about this from old Chinese, Babylonian, Egyptian writings. It's been around a long, long time. No one knew where it came from. People did notice that actually that malaria tends to be worse around swamps. And what do swamps have? They have smelly bad air. The people often thought maybe it's through the bad air, hence the name. Malaria is the Italian word for bad air. Even 500 years ago, as you this woodcut, some people actually did think possibly insects communicated malaria, but they weren't really sure in order to prove it. But about 100 years ago, this gentleman here, who was an English um, um, military surgeon, actually was able to prove that malaria was spread by insects. He did this actually by testing on live humans, you know, volunteers in quotation marks. He couldn't do that today. Um, but nevertheless, if I could prove this, it's a great breakthrough. And for his work, he actually won the Nobel Prize in 1902. I should actually say briefly, this was very controversial because there were many other people doing very similar work at the same time, so, um, but he was the first guy to actually get the prize. Let me just briefly show you the malaria transmission cycle. So, uh, as discovered by Dr. Ross, so malaria gets inside a, a mosquito. I'll show you how in a moment. And the mosquito lands on a poor unfortunate victim, some person, typically when they're sleeping. And the mosquito has no malicious interest. It's not trying to give you malaria. It simply wants a little bit of your blood. <laughs> but while taking your blood from you, unfortunately, may give you some of these malaria parasites. These malaria parasites will get inside your body, go straight to your liver, where it will cause all kinds of nasty complications, which eventually will actually spread into all your blood cells and um, explode throughout your body. At this point, a second mosquito comes and takes a snack from you. And now this mosquito now although originally it was a virgin in terms of um, uh, disease, now also has the disease, and was spread to the next person, and to the next person, and so on, planetary. So this is the basic cycle that we've known about for a hundred years. I'll just gloss over this. Let's actually talk about the mosquito. And it really is a remarkable little animal. It's quite incredible. First of all, it's an amazing surgeon, what it can do for you. So when it flies to you, it knows that if it pricks you, it might wake you up, so it gives you a local anesthetic first, like a dentist might do. <laughs> it also knows that if it sucks out the blood, the blood will congeal. So what does it do? It gives you some anticoagulant. Right? So this actually is an incredibly advanced surgeon. And it's not surprising because it had a long hand to actually learned its skill. Mosquitoes have been around for at least 100 million years. Right? You know, in the dinosaur times, for example, um, mosquitoes were around. So there's lots of mosquitoes. There's 3,528 different kinds of mosquitoes. Uh, that, that was last week, it could have changed. Right? <laughs> and of those, about 40 or 50 cause problems for human beings. A few of the others cause problems for birds or frogs or lizards, we don't care about those. Some are actually vegetarians, some actually have no problem at all. But the 40 or 50 do cause a lot of problems. There are alive today 100 trillion mosquitoes. But it's hard to kind of envision that. There are 7 billion people on the planet but there were at least 7 billion mosquitoes born this morning. Mm -hmm. And it's not 8 o'clock yet, right? The day isn't finished. Mm -hmm. There's lots of these guys, as you can imagine. Um, and mosquitoes have been, again, sucking blood for at least 100 million years. They've also had malaria, or spread it for at least 35 million years. I mean, that's because mosquitoes have been found in amber. We can date amber very well. And if you look inside the amber carefully, you can see the um, malaria parasites. So we're up against a really tough problem. Humans have been around for you know, tens of thousands of years, 
Muskies have been doing this for hundreds of millions of years. They're experts at what they do. <laughs> so, I, I start by saying that um, malaria kills a million people this year. That's kind of hard to believe because does anybody know anybody who's died of malaria? Right? It, it's quite, you know, it doesn't seem possible, right? So here's a nice visual example of uh, where the problem is. Let's do a clever little trick here. Let's take a map of the world, and let's take each country. If the country gets more than its fair share of malaria, let's make it a little bit bigger of a country. And if a country gets less than its share of malaria, let's make it a little bit smaller. Okay? So look at the map, and here's the new map. <laughs> yeah. What you can see is that North America and Europe completely disappear. Malaria essentially is not a problem at all, right? Uh, there's a little bit of a bump here, such as Asia, India, Cambodia, Thailand, all these places. But the most obvious thing about malaria is uh, Africa. Africa explodes. So most of the people who die from malaria are actually African children. Uh, these are the victims. So we're looking at a million people each year. And again, part of this actually is that if you're a healthy Westerner in the developed world, getting malaria isn't a big deal. It's an inconvenience, but you know, who cares? So, George Clooney, for whom I'm often mistaken, by the way, um, <laughs> he's had malaria several times. He looks pretty healthy. He looks fine, right? Uh, so, if you're a healthy Westerner, good medicine, good hospitals, it's an inconvenience. If you're an African child, it may be a death sentence to get malaria. And I was briefly mentioned in passing that actually, although malaria domestically in America essentially is non-existent, for our soldiers, um, uh, it has been a big deal. So at least in the last century, more soldiers were taken off the field of combat by malaria than by enemy bullets or bombs. And that's why actually the military is very interested in malaria. In fact, Walter Reed Hospital has 400 doctors who do nothing but malaria all the time. It's a high priority for the U.S. military. What is really pernicious and nasty about malaria is that malaria causes poverty, and poverty causes malaria. And whenever you have this in any system where A causes B and B causes A, it's got all a positive feedback cycle, it's very hard to fix or escape that. So how, how is that true? How does um, poverty cause malaria? Well, if you're poor, you probably don't live in Newport Beach. You might live in a place that's actually less desirable, where there's less drainage, you have more mosquitoes. And you also probably don't live in a nice house that can be air-conditioned and airtight. You probably live in a shack or a dwelling that's actually not mosquito-proof. So poverty does cause malaria. Um, malaria also causes poverty. And why is that? Well, think about it. The way many countries in the developing world escape from poverty, at least initially, is through tourism, that kind of thing. But tourists are not going to go to a place that has a lot of malaria. That's not going to happen. And it's hard to get economic development when half the workers are basically in bed all the time. So companies don't go there and so forth. Even agriculture is a hard time in such places. So it's a really pernicious cycle. Once a place has a lot of malaria, it's hard to escape from that by any method. So we've known for 110 years how malaria is spread. And the question is, where's the magic pill? Right? So here's an old uh, snake oil type thing where the magic pill to cure malaria. Of course, it didn't work. Where is the magic pill to cure malaria? So actually, for polio, if I had this talk, you know, uh, 100 years ago, we'd be in some situation, polio is essentially cured for all kinds of purposes now. Why not malaria? Well, I'm not going to give the answer, so I'm not totally qualified. Uh, one reason. Uh, but in, in essence, the answer is malaria is a very hard thing to actually cure. And again, part of the reason is because mosquitoes were spread malaria 40, 50 million years ago before humans ever came to the scene. It had a lot of experience. It's done a very good job at this. We're really new to this thing, literally. Mm. So there is currently no magic cure for malaria. There are some drugs you take to help uh, your health afterwards, and so on and so forth, uh, but there's nothing out there right now. Mm. However, there are some interventions that can actually help malaria. I want to discuss those interventions. So uh, I thought it's a small fund, uh, but I want to emphasize that there's lots of possible interventions that can help prevent malaria. So one that's very cheap and effective is using mosquito nets. And these actually date back to Egyptian times, believe it or not. You can also spray chemicals to kill adult mosquitoes. You can find all the local ponds and lakes uh, with slim water, and you can fill them in. And if you can't fill them in, you can toss in fish or special frogs or crustaceans actually will eat the um, uh, mosquito larva. Uh, what else can you do? You can spray chemical fields. You can... Um, 
release sterile mosquitoes, and so on and so forth. So these are some basic ideas. There are hundreds of ideas to actually reduce malaria and mosquitoes, and they can be quite effective. Here's an old Chinese propaganda poster. It's a bit hard to read, but they actually suggest this in the 60s. Uh, four very simple ideas, including using bed nets, spraying insecticides, filling in all small ditches, and then putting uh, little fish in the ponds to kill the mosquitoes. And China was actually able to largely eliminate malaria, which is very, very simple ideas. Because China had a lot of control of its people, which kind of helped in some sense, too, right? But nevertheless. So I want to make a point, which is very important to my work, which I'm getting to slowly, about intervention in the jar. Interventions always cost money. They're never free. And even the so-called cheap interventions cost some money. So mosquito nets you can make for about 3 or $4 per each. But if you simply toss them out of back of trucks, you're wasting your time. Right? And the reason is because people have discovered this is if you give out free mosquito nets in Africa, for example, is people often don't use them. They actually do use them for fishing nets. They use them for wedding veils, for room dividers. They use them for all kinds of things. But a lot of people won't sleep underneath them for various cultural reasons, like they're slightly warmer or, or whatever it is. So you can't simply give out mosquito nets. You have to get bodies in the ground, educators, nurses, maintenance, incentive programs, whatever it is. So all these interventions cost money, and it's actually an important thing to realize. So let me tell you the malaria mantra, which I've learned from talking to many people all over the world, which is that with malaria, you do it cheap or don't do it at all. So if you have a cure for malaria that costs $100, in Africa, it might as well be a billion dollars. It's not going to happen. Anything you do for malaria has to be cheap. So, for example, ironically, Bill Gates is putting maybe a billion dollars into malaria, but he's putting all this money into making cheap solutions, right? Because a billion dollars will go nowhere in the long run. He needs to find a cheaper solution, uh, and that's what the research has actually been spent. So cheap is important. So let me give you an example of why this is the case. Let's imagine that you have some money, and you're going to have some interventions in Africa. It could be bed net distribution, it could be spraying these insects, it could be taking these fish and putting them in the ponds to kill the mosquitoes, whatever it is. And you have enough money to do 65 interventions, 65 doctors and entomologists, whatever it is, and you're going to try and solve the problem here in Africa. So naively, what you might do is simply say, OK, I'm going to be fair. I'm going to spread my interventions out evenly to 65 places in Africa. But if you did this, you'd be making a big mistake, because let's say this is actually a map here of where the mosquitoes are in Africa. And red means lots of mosquitoes, white means no mosquitoes. If you spread out your resources evenly, of course, then all these resources here are totally wasted. Whereas placed up here, like up in the Nile Delta, you didn't actually hit well enough at all. So you need to actually put the resources exactly where they're needed. This is a critical thing that people often miss. This is actually what we really wanted, is to make these resources adaptively be in the worst places. So I'll show you actually this on an example of a map of all of Africa for clarity, but actually we want to do this on a tiny uh, scale. Most mosquitoes live and die their entire lives in a small area. Maybe the size of a football field, that's small and local. So we want to actually have very localized interventions. And it's a problem because the place where the mosquitoes are changes from month to month, from year to year, in kind of unpredictable ways. So how do we know where to spend the resources? This is the big question we're working on. And there's two ways you can do this that have happened in the past. One is you measure surrogates. So a surrogate is a measurement of something that you get indirectly. So you can actually call the hospitals and look at the hospital admissions, and that tells you about the prevalence of malaria and mosquitoes. But the problem is, by the time you do that, it's already a month too late, basically. So that's not going to work too well. You look at the weather conditions, because mosquitoes breed in these little ponds. And so if it rains, you know there's going to be more mosquitoes. But it's actually very kind of indirect and coarse-grained. It's not good enough information. So another possibility actually is you can have sticky traps. Actually, a company here in Riverside called Iska is actually very famous for making these high-quality traps. And what you do is you put lots of these little traps out in the field, and then once a week you have someone go and look at them. And there's two problems with this. The first of all is that um, it does take human time and skill to look at these traps. And the second thing is that if you look at them once a week, well, some mosquitoes only live as adults for seven to ten days. So by the time you actually realize you have a big burst of mosquitoes, it again may already be too late. 
And also I should mention, actually, when you look at these traps, there's a lot of sticky brown dots in them. It takes a real expert to actually look and figure out what's actually on these traps. It isn't obvious to people. So, I've already talked about my little contribution to this, which is, I think that we can actually put very, very cheap sensors into the field that can measure exactly what mosquitoes are in real time. And that information can be automatically emailed to the uh, doctors, entomologists, whoever it is, with the interventions, with pinpoint precision in time and space. So, there's some constraints on what I'm doing here, one of which is, it needs to be cheap, as I've already mentioned. And there's two reasons that to be cheap. One is, I need to have, potentially, millions of these sensors in Africa, so they can't be too expensive. And secondly, if they were expensive, unfortunately, they would be probably stolen, and for parts and pieces. So it has to be so cheap that people would actually walk past it and not even care about it. Okay. It has to be cheap. It has to be low powered because in Africa it's often hard to find reliable electricity, as you can imagine. And it has to be accurate. We need to actually know of those 3,528 different kinds of mosquitoes, which species we have, which sex we have, and we have to ignore the good insects like the bees and the butterflies and so on and so forth. So how are we going to do this? Well, here's the basic idea of an apparatus uh, I designed, trying to do this. And here's actually a physical instantiation of it. So here's how it works. It's a very simple idea. We have a very small laser beam that shoots out like so. When I talk laser, don't think James Bond laser. Think 99 cent laser pointer. Again, it has to be cheap and low power. <coughs> so the laser shoots out here and it hits this. This is a total internal reflector, which is basically a bicycle reflector for all intents and purposes. Actually, so exactly what it is. And the bicycle effector reflects the light back in the same direction with some small amount of scatter. And just above the laser pointer, we have a phototransistor. What a phototransistor is, is it measures how much light has been hit. So you probably have these in your house to guide the outside lights, and many times the lights come out automatically. The exact same thing, but it can actually change very, very fast. So as our insect here is flapping his wings, he's actually, or she in most cases, is actually occluding the light in different patterns. And we actually uh, can pick this up essentially as though it's sound. So effectively, we're hearing the mosquito, or insect, with light. And then once we hear, we can actually make a signal, and we hope we'll examine the signal here to figure out what kind of mosquito we have, as I'll show you in a moment. So those of you who actually work in your home might recognize that some of these parts actually have parts from plumbing. And again, it's actually part of the deliberate design. This thing needs to be very cheap and ubiquitous and easy to manipulate and fix and so forth. So if all goes well, I can maybe demonstrate this. Uh, hopefully this will work. I'm going to actually play you some of the sound that we get from the sensor. And again, this is not really technically sound, because it's not measured acoustically, it's measured optically, but it, it sounds like sound. Let me try this. This will hopefully be a B if all works out well. So the B could be right over here on this wall, and our sensor could be on this wall. So from 50, 60 feet away, as the B5 pass our laser, we'd actually capture that sound, which is that we could not do, of course, acoustically. Okay, so um, this is what the signal looks like in the raw audio. But, and we can actually look at the bleep here to count the insects. So anytime you see a big bleep like this, you only have one insect. But what this does not tell you is what kind of insect it is, and whether it's a male or a female. So we need to do some more tricks for this. I'll show you just one trick briefly. Um, we can actually measure a spectrogram here, which basically tells you these little peaks where the frequency is in the insect. So here's a big peak at 197 hertz, and that tells us that the insect has beaten its wings 197 times per second. So I've done this once here for 1B, and what I can do is, because the peak was at 197, I can write down here in this axis one little blip that corresponds to one count at that frequency. And I'm going to get more Bs and do it again and again and again. And here's multiple Bs, I've measured this. And I've built this little histogram here that kind of tells me the signature of Bs. I know that Bs tend to be between about 100 and 200. And of course, I'll do this for more insects. 
and I built a profile up for each of my different insects of interest here. So how does this help? I can encode this knowledge in my sensor, and now in the field next week, when an insect flies past my sensor here, I can measure its uh, characteristic beep. In this case, it's at 210 hertz, whatever. I can look up on my axis here, I can figure out this is almost certainly a bee. Because it's a very low frequency sound, it could be a mosquito, it's a bee. And the next insect comes by, and its uh, frequency is at 705 hertz, and this is certainly a mosquito, because it lands here, and so on and so forth. So of course, you've already figured out that actually this won't work for every insect. So for example, if I have an insect that comes past my sensor here, and its frequency is at uh, 602 hertz, it kind of lands in between the two possibilities here. I don't know essentially if it's a red or a blue. So I need to do some other tricks to try to figure out which kind of insect that is. And so actually, I don't have a complete answer for this yet. We have some tricks and some answers. Um, we look at various other, other measurements and sensors. But eventually, hopefully, we will be able to actually classify all kinds of insects based upon this acoustic signal. So to kind of conclude up here, in the example of the previous page, we actually have 6,000 insects in our, in our little insectaries. We tested them, and we're at 96% accurate, which actually is pretty good. It's a bit of a contrived problem, but we're still actually doing quite accurate with these cheap low-powered sensors. And so we're currently working on finding um, more features that actually classify more accurately. And did you know where we are right now? We have a $100,000 grant from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which has actually been very helpful to us. And if we get good results, we're hoping in the next few months, they will actually up this to a million dollars, which will actually get some real work done. And make my dean very happy, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and you may have already spotted this, actually, but although we're interested in malaria mosquitoes in Africa, there are lots of possibilities that you have spin-offs in agriculture. So in this state of California alone, insects do $10 billion of damage to orchards and vineyards and, and plants each year. And some of the insects are crawling insects, but some are flying insects, so potentially you could spin this off to orchards and to vineyards and actually make some money commercialize this here too, which would be useful to put the money back into malaria research and other things. Okay, I'm basically done. Uh, to conclude, we've seen what malaria is, we've seen why it's such a nasty problem. So think about it, it's 9-11 number of deaths every single day in Africa. It's a really nasty disease. We've seen some interventions that can help, and we've seen actually how we can hopefully use our cheap sensors to actually steer the interventions, to tell people, spend your time, spend your money right here, but not here. Mm -hmm. And so we want to thank my postdoc, uh, Gustavo, and uh, my local collaborator, uh, Ajahn Bafanetto. At that point, I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs>